This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing the laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive Home and Auto Policies. They're best when bundled too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save over $775 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $779 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states. Welcome to The Intro Zone, a show about the SharePoint intelligent intranet. This show takes you inside and outside of SharePoint. You'll hear from experts behind the scenes and out in the field. It's all about how SharePoint fits into your everyday work life, with the goal being to share and manage content, knowledge, and applications in order to empower teamwork throughout your organization. I'm Mark Cashman, here with my co-host for this episode, Naomi Moneypenny. Naomi is at the forefront of what we do for all things search and discovery, and really is focused on both our vision and messaging, and uh, how we build in intelligence from a search perspective that really translates that then to, into these really nice discovery experiences. She's been involved with things in the past that are focused on your social internet. She's a huge advocate for Yammer and how that comes into play to build in nice experiences to guide customers, how they can make their internet more engaging and more informative. So I'm really excited to have Naomi here as a co-host. Thank you, Naomi, for joining us. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm delighted to be here. And today in our guest segments, we're going to be talking with Agnes Molnar, the CEO of Search Explained, and Jeff Reed, our architect at BA Insight. In each episode, we'll cover important topics and information about Microsoft SharePoint, including segments on news and announcements. This week, we focus on search, search experience, both finding and discovering content and people. Tell us what's going on as far as news and announcements. What are some recent things in your world that you see releasing or, or have been shipped recently? Sure, Mark. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is our ability to put Yammer conversations in a beautiful new way inside of SharePoint sites. And that doesn't matter if it's a SharePoint site like a team site or one of our newer communication sites uh, or even just a page. So maybe it's a news article that you've published inside of SharePoint and you're able to put Yammer conversations in there. So you're not changing or doing anything different sort of from a Yammer perspective. You have that same community. It could be something around uh, best practices discussion. It could be be something where you're talking about a topic of interest, but then you have the ability to include those conversations as part of what you're doing in SharePoint. And so there's a few things that really make it different. Uh, one is the ability to show thus the top posts in that particular group. So for example, if I want to show things where people are interacting a lot on there because I want to draw people in from SharePoint, from my intranet into those conversations on my community. The other option is around having, having the latest conversations. And those latest conversations are just bubbling up the things that people are sort of thinking about top of mind. And so it's another great way to be able to share the latest there uh, and really have that me be part of maybe more of the things you might do for a team site, for example, or a community where people are visiting uh, quite frequently. And then the other option that we're actually offering as well is the ability to curate specific threads uh, as part of that community. And those threads could then be things like maybe the frequently asked questions or really popular topics that have come up in the past, but you're able to sort of pick out those individual conversations and include them as part of the content that you have on SharePoint. And I think the also big advantage is now the Yammer web part uh, is good on mobile. Exactly. And that's what makes it amazing, right? You can get that rich experience. You're still in the SharePoint mobile app, which we love, and really being able to scroll through those conversations there. And then you can click over into your Yammer community very simply. So it's a, it's a great experience and out of the box just works beautifully. I was going to say, I've used it and you literally just drop it on the page, mm -hmm. program it in the way you want, a couple of radio buttons of choices, and then you've got nice engagement on your page, your site. Yep. Super simple. Um, on my side, I've been seeing a few things, obviously, releasing. We've got the SharePoint hub sites. That's a big one. So they're now fully 100% in targeted release uh, and going into production relatively soon. Hub sites are really uh, kind of a, a parent level to team sites and communication sites that help associate those all together. And you get some benefits off of that. You get a cross-site navigation across all those sites that are now brought together. And you get some scoped search, big for today, obviously a pretty important. So instead of crossing the whole enterprise when you do a search, you're just scoped across across the associated sites and the hub itself. Um, and then you get some other benefits where you get a consistent theme and things like news and activities roll up. So when you apply a hub site, 
You then have kind of a parent location for a project team that's across multiple projects or something that's maybe regionally driven where you're bringing the whole region together, all their team sites and communication sites. So great response so far. Really nice to see how people are using it. And we can't wait to see as it scales, you know, the amount of people that are going to use it and, and certainly their feedback as we start to evolve that over time. Mm-hmm. I love um, that the flexibility it has for your intranet, right, and that redesign and the ability to change there. Amazing stuff. Yeah, and I think actually the Yammer web part at the hub site homepage mm-hmm. is a really important one. You know, when you get the conversation going much more broad across the company, across a topic, across a, and you get it across multiple people and groups, uh, you know, you see that engagement at that parent level. Uh, you know, Yammer is a great fit there. Mm-hmm. Um, We're also bringing modern theming to classic sites. So it's one of those questions we often get, you know, what about classic and modern? So we're bringing the modern theming. You don't have to adapt it or adopt it in classic sites, but now you can. So with just a a little adjustment on the classic site itself, now you can bring in the modern theming experience, which is kind of that right rail pane experience to be able to choose your new theme. But then the new themes also then apply to then how they apply to when you join a hub site, which you can in a classic site once you've modernized a few things. We have a couple new things in the SharePoint mobile app. I'll just rattle these off pretty quickly. They're self-explanatory. But now if somebody comments on your news post, you'll get a notification. Um, You can like news articles from within the SharePoint mobile app. And we also have a new updated people experience, which is very similar to what we had before, but it flows a little bit nicer. And it also includes now a view into email connections that you've made in addition to the files and the people that you have in context with that person that you're looking up. So now emails that you've had between that person, you would see it on the people card within the SharePoint mobile app. This week's topic is search and the advantage of search to end users. My co-host this week is Naomi Moneypenny, an expert on search and discovery for intranets, and she's a member of the same team I'm on here at the SharePoint team. Her focus, of course, is search and discovery. Discovery is what we talk about when you think of all the things that are becoming intelligent because of the Microsoft graph. The more that we know about you, the more we know about what you work on, we can then present a much more discoverable, personal, relevant experience. Naomi owns all of that. You may have heard of something like Delve. She owns Delve. She's a product manager, great asset on the team. Naomi, you are the perfect co-host anytime. But on this specific topic, you are the perfect co-host because this is your domain. This is really where you've been spending a lot of time for a long time, but now as a part of Microsoft, it's what you own. You did a great demo at Ignite, and uh, I've heard a lot about it just from people asking me questions. Does what Naomi showed, is that shipped yet or is that coming or how can that how can that be configured? And there was a little segment in the keynote that we'll play here that um, I'm going to call the sushi receipt section. <laughs> But basically it was OCR, you know, character recognition where off a receipt, somebody took a picture of that, put it in their OneDrive, and then that would flowed right in to be able to be discovered in a lot of different ways. And the way that you presented it was really great. So let's take a second real quickly to hear how you did the sushi sushi receipt. Uh, And this is Naomi uh, talking at the Ignite Conference in Orlando, Florida from September 2017. All right, so there's a few other things that I need to do. And one of those is filing expenses. And so like me, if you go to OneDrive and you upload a picture of your receipt as you're doing a specific transaction or you scan it into OneDrive, uh, you can also do this inside of SharePoint. I can go ahead and actually search for receipts. And earlier in the year, we announced that we were automatically categorizing any kind of work object. So if you have receipts, business cards, letterheads, uh, it could be any kind of uh, a document that looks like a, a specific ones that are related to work, we're actually automatically categorizing those as you upload them into SharePoint and into OneDrive. And so I can see, I can check out, I have a whole bunch of different receipts here. Okay, that's really cool. But, you know, it's expenses, right? I don't remember exactly what it was that I used this receipt for. I really want to think about, okay, I had that customer dinner, and I don't remember the the name of the place because, you know, we're traveling. But I do remember that we ate sushi. So I'll go ahead and search for sushi. And so what we're pleased to announce today is that you can see I get an amazing uh, result right off the bat, but I didn't put any metadata in or anything else to explain this different file. But what we, we are showing today is that we have automatic text extraction capabilities that came right from the uh, document itself. How cool is that, right? <laughs> so, 
So no longer do you have to go off and, and do those searches. You don't have to tag it. You don't have to look at the content there. And again, that works for all kinds of images, right? The kinds of previews we've talked about already. It's not just photos. It can also work for things like x-ray and medical images as well. So that made me hungry, for one. I would like a nice <laughs> plate of sashimi. Um, but moving beyond that, just real quickly, your summary. Obviously, uh, I want to hear a little bit about what the reaction you got while you were on stage. And after that, what have people asked about that particular sushi receipt section? And it's great. It's a great question. And yes, I think I think I'm hungry also <laughs> thinking about that too. So, uh, but I think we're always hungry for more intelligence and more knowledge too, right? And that's what it really comes down to. And so, the really the big benefit that I see here, we think about you doing your work every single day, sitting at your computer, or maybe you're a task worker and you're working on your mobile environment. Um, it's really that ability to be able to extract information from content that was difficult to search before. And I think we really want to think about how we unlock intelligence from that specific content. And this could be inside of images. So things like receipts or business cards or letters, or it could be signs, maps, all kinds of information like that. And really how we unlock that text from those images automatically. And so the big benefit we're seeing here from an end user perspective is that as soon as I take a picture, it could be with OneDrive, I could be just uploading pictures into SharePoint. So they could be conventional pictures, photographs of locations perhaps that you're scouting out. But it could also so be things like x-ray images or pictures of a whiteboard. And so we're applying intelligence behind the scenes that helps you both detect what kind of an object that is. So really understanding whether that object is a whiteboard, maybe it's looking at a business card, understanding a receipt, and so helping you to automatically detect that. And so you can do a search just for those things. So I haven't done anything special on my, my mobile applications. I've taken a picture with OneDrive or I'm uploading a picture into SharePoint. I can just search for the word receipt and it's going to find all of the things which are receipts for me, right? And that's a super powerful thing just in of itself, right? Because if you're like me and you sort of tend to remember things a certain way and it's like, I need to find that receipt for my end of the month expenses, right? You've got to do that. And so we can use that detection to go one step further. So it's not just the object itself and what kind of object it is, but we're automatically extracting the text out of there. And that's what makes it really exciting if you think about it from just a, an end user perspective. So it's not just images that we're working on there. So in search within Microsoft altogether, we were also unlocking that content inside of video as well. And so you might have seen some of the things we've done with Microsoft Stream recently. Uh, and so if you upload a video into Stream or you record yourself from Stream, uh, then you have the ability for that video to be automatically transcribed, which makes it super powerful and easy to search, but also gives you amazing capabilities for accessibility and inclusiveness because you have closed captions automatically generated as part of that. So we're really looking at how you unlock that intelligence intelligence from the different images and the different types of content that you have available to you. So one of the takeaways that I heard is that I could actually take the x-ray that my radiologist gave me before they do any assessment. I could upload that into SharePoint and it will tell me what my ailment is. <laughs> Is that right? I wish, yeah. <laughs> We're not quite there with that prediction, mm -hmm. but, but but it could look at least to say, you know, if there's a, a skew number on that, if there's a number that in there that helps to identify what it is, or maybe it's your name. I don't know the Im information they have on the, the uh, x-rays themselves. But just being able to search for that information mm -hmm. basically helps you very quickly to be able to unlock, again, that information. Yeah, and make I, it I think if we sort of look at that, the history of how to have people gone about search. How do mm -hmm. they configure it? How do they use it? I think big big issue is always getting more information about the app object itself. Mm -hmm. What is this image? What's in it? What's this document? What's in it? And a lot of people talk about, you know, add metadata, put metadata in, in you know, increase the discoverability by talking more about it. And always for the end user, that's hard. That's time. That's remembering to do it. Is there a form to fill out? What I hear you're saying also is the service on the back end, the machine learning, is doing a lot of that auto categorization for you. Maybe not to the nth degree, but as we incrementally get there, there's less and less that needs to be input, but the discoverability and the findability is going up and up. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I think that's really a big direction for us. So as we mentioned, we're doing this kind of work with images, with video. If you look inside of videos right now, we're able to do facial detection. So you can see when the speaker has changed, for example, and that's just happening automatically when you're uploading the video. So when we think about that and sort of really how we use that in a business context, you could go even further and think, okay, what could more could we do, right? What could we do when we see extracted text, you know, whether it's sushi or whatever it is, right? Uh, maybe it's something like, you know, W2 or 
something like that, right, that has a specific uh, type of, of form that might be associated with it. Maybe there's actions we could take on behalf of the user and obviously with their permission and with their acknowledgement uh, to be able to look at what we could do to help them process that kind of information faster. And so I think this kind of leads us into more of understanding, you know, more generally what we're doing with search, which I know is a huge direction across the entire company. It's not just what we're doing inside of SharePoint. Uh, it's really looking across what we're doing with Microsoft 365. So let's pause just for a second and, and start with the kind of the latest user experience when mm -hmm. we think about search. You know, you type a keyword into the text box and then magic happens. But I think it's even before you hit return. Mm -hmm. But maybe just walk us through kind of that new experience in Office 365 and certainly across SharePoint, OneDrive, lots of different places that are pulling in information that the search will then discover. But from an user perspective, how are things becoming more personalized? Sure. It's a great question. And as you know, we've had the Microsoft Graph uh, for many years now. Uh, some of the uh, early work that we did uh, when we acquired a, another company, Fast, uh, way back in 2008, and incorporated that technology into inside of SharePoint and more generally now inside of Office 365, really gave us that underpinning to help understand people and what they do every single day day. And so it's learning in the background. It's learning about your collaboration patterns, how you're working with other people, what kinds of documents you're accessing, who maybe you're emailing with, who kind of people are on their calendars and other meetings, could be tasks, could be just what you're editing and uploading. And so it's able to have some intelligence about understanding what's going on inside of your work life so that it's able to understand a little bit about what's relevant to you. And so we can overlay that collaborative work pattern data with really understanding what we have about an organization. So looking at your organizational reporting relationships, maybe even the devices you're using, and even things like LinkedIn, right, being able to reach out in, into those profiles too. So what does that really mean, right, for your question in terms of what does personalization look like when you're just working with this stuff every single day? And that means that the minute you click into a search box inside of SharePoint or in office.com, for example, you start getting results. So even before you've even pressed a single character into that search box, it understands that it's Mark, or wherever it is, right, that's looking at that content, and it's going to give you results. And so those results are there to help you go back and find content that you work with a lot, or maybe sites that you work with frequently, or maybe it's just uh, other query suggestions for what other people are looking for. And so just having access to that information makes it a much faster experience, a much richer experience. We did a lot of research to understand, like, oftentimes you're not just doing a search straight off the bat for something new. Oftentimes, you're just trying to find something you were working on before, right? Before you went into the meetings or before you were working a few days ago, right? And so you just want to refine the things that you already have. And so that's really what we think about from a sort of that experience from going straight into the search box. And we want that experience to be consistent. So it shouldn't matter if I'm in SharePoint search or if I'm in office.com as maybe my starting page for the day or even inside of an office application. So having that personal personalization work across all of these different experiences is really important, but helps you to understand and find that information and then have that information if you do choose to actually execute a search and put in a regular query as you would. Uh, when you put in that query term, the results that you get back are personalized for you. That means that the way that they're ranked on the page is really trying to hit on the relevance for you as an individual. What we're not doing is somehow decreasing the scope of the results or anything else there, but what we are trying to do is really say, here's the ranking that we think is most relevant for Mark based on all of that insight that we've generated as part of the Microsoft Graph. Of course, you're only ever going to see results that you have access to. And so content, whether it's in SharePoint, whether it's in OneDrive, could be even be email attachments, all of those things, they're always going to be security trimmed by the graph. So you'll always only have access to that content. We get that a lot. And I think a lot of people who think about moving into Office 365, adopting the search and, and really program it, you know, like, like you can. Um, a lot of people are in initially concerned, you know, am I going to get overexposed? When people go searching, what are they going to find? Are they going to find things they shouldn't? Um, and I think by nature of what you just said, obviously the answer is no. When we layer on top of that the graph, sometimes the question comes up again. And again, based on your what you were just stating, I think still the answer is no. You, It's your content, and it's still going to be based on how you've set permissions, who you've shared with, and obviously who you haven't shared with. So a lot of times when you see these new intelligent experiences, you only see what you have permissions to see. And that's pretty important. Um, when we go beyond personalization 
And you think about, you know, in our previous episode, we talk about content service. SharePoint provides a content service to a lot of other applications, some of ours and some of our first and third parties. When you think about search as a consistent search service, where are we building in that search experience to where the user is? What, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question, Mark. Thank you. And we really want to think about search meeting you everywhere, right? So it's really about you and all of the applications where you're getting work done. I do want to contrast this because in a business environment, it's really not about having one page that I have to go off to a web browser and I get a blank page with a big search box on it. We really want to move beyond that kind of consumer approach. We really want search and, in fact, proactive right search that's really working hard for you to be incorporated in every experience that you're in. And so, again, that doesn't matter if I'm in SharePoint and I'm getting my work done inside of SharePoint and I'm modifying documents and working on different areas. I could be inside of office.com, again, starting my day, looking at exploration of the different apps that I have uh, available to me as part of office.com. I could even look at the discovery feed that's in there too. So I have access to both a search capability and a way to discover new content as part of that experience. But where this really, really lights up is inside of all of our other applications. And so those are the ones, those productivity apps that we all know and love every day. So whether that's Outlook, that's inside of Word, inside of PowerPoint, and even inside of Windows as the operating system, that same consistent search experience, the ability to reuse content from other people. We have a great feature inside of PowerPoint and Word and Outlook uh, that's called Tap. It allows you to tap into the knowledge of your organization. And that allows you from one of the menus there to say, insert document item. And then you'll actually get a personalized search pane that actually comes up right within inside of PowerPoint. And that allows you to do a little search there and you can actually find pictures or graphics that could be used as well as slides from your colleagues. So if I'm building a new PowerPoint presentation and I want to reuse the work that you've already done, I don't have to go off to some separate experience. I don't have to go off and open my web browser and hunt around trying to find the right PowerPoint that you created a couple weeks ago. I can do all of that straight inside of the application where I'm doing my work. And that's really the big difference when we think about the business world and how we're sort of integrating this into the work you want to get done. Finding and searching is not a means, it's not the sort of the end, right? It's really that means to an end. What really matters is how we take that, that finding and actually turn it into action and turn it into insight so you can get your work done faster. Yeah, just as an end user, I've always loved that in context. Keep me where I'm working. I don't want to have to open up multiple browsers or multiple applications. But I also want to find very quickly what it is I'm looking for. So I, I, I should be able to do that right in, in the context of where I'm working. And I've seen the way that the service has evolved in the back end, the things that it's recommending to me, the things that I discover across the whole suite, and really wherever it is that I'm working, I might get recommendations or that quicker time to finishing something that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's invaluable to me, and hopefully on behalf of how I would extrapolate that and everything you've said and about an end user working in this environment, that that's just going to save them a ton of time, a ton of efforts, and maybe delight them every once in a while. Here, here is something that, based on the people you work with and what you're working on, here's something we find interesting to you. That's and right. that will build on if they sort of commit to then opening that or sharing it, that adds to then refining what the service knows about them and what it can recommend next. Exactly. And then even using sort of our human heuristics, right, to be able to find more information that's useful. So oftentimes we remember, you know, who the people we were in a meeting with, uh, you know, were, but we don't really remember the name of the document, right? So that's a, a common search occurrence for us. But we can oftentimes want to navigate, perhaps I'm in SharePoint and I, I see that recently you've been modifying some files or I could look you up uh, inside of even an office application. And I say, okay, I'm going to check out Mark's profile here. And then I can scroll down to some of the files that you've recently shared. And then if I wanted to, I could open up that extended panel there and actually search just within those files. So it makes it much easier for me. Okay, I remember I was in the meeting with Mark. Mark shared something in there as about a press release template maybe. And then I can go in, look at your profile, and then be able to do searching within inside of that, that shared file context. And that really helps you, right? It's that memory aid, that memory journey of being able to find that content much faster. Yeah, so I, I see a ton of innovation in the search space. I, I think we've made a lot of progress. We see partners making a ton of progress on top of what we're doing. And I think we see adoption and use increasing with, a, of course, a, a ton of feedback to refine off of that. So I think you have a job, you know, going into the future <laughs> and uh, really hearing you talk about it here, the way that you portray it, you know, up on stage at the big keynote type moments. Um, I think there's a lot of things coming at the SharePoint conference that we'll share Absolutely. fairly soon. <laughs> so very excited about this space and, and, of course, love chatting with you and hearing about that. Um, 
But let's move in and talk to one of our experts that are is that kind of lives beyond Microsoft, Agnes Molnar. We have the pleasure today to talk to Agnes Molnar. She's a Microsoft MVP, a principal consultant, uh, owner and trainer of a company called Search Explained. And this is a training and consultancy company based out of Hungary. But if you think about it, she's for the whole world on her website. If you go to searchexplained.com, you'll find all of what she offers, sometimes free, sometimes in person for paid. And, of course, she's at a lot of different events around the world. Uh, you can find her on Twitter at Search Explained. That's at S-E-A-R-C-H-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-E-D. And so we're very pleased to have her here. You know, if you go looking on the Internet for anything around how to make SharePoint search more accessible to you, to learn more, you might find her free search ebook uh, that she recently published with insights around 2018. It's a free report, and it actually brings in a lot of great insights from other experts as well. So we want to take a moment and just welcome you, Agnes. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Mark, and it's my pleasure to be here today. So you've really been focused on SharePoint search for a very long time, Agnes. I know that uh, that's how I first came to know you as well, way back when in our SharePoint community days. And so I was just curious, like, how did you get started with SharePoint? Oh, it was a very funny story because it happened back in 2001 with the SharePoint 2001. I was a developer at that time and I got a new job. And my task was to use the SharePoint APIs, actually the SharePoint search APIs, to search in Exchange emails. So it was a really funny project. Uh, and the only thing I saw from SharePoint was its APIs. So I did not even know that it had, you know, a user interface at all. So this Proof of concept and this project was, was successful. So I've got a new project with SharePoint where I had to implement a document management system. And I was really surprised that, oh my God, SharePoint is much more than just you know APIs for developers. So this is how it all started. And after those two projects, uh, everyone started to consider me as a SharePoint expert. So I started to uh, do trainings about SharePoint and I just stayed with SharePoint. I love it. I actually now want to use the SharePoint search API to read my email every morning. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Yes, but I think I think it would be scary as well. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> So I know that one of the things that you really talk about is search strategies to help harness the full value of collective knowledge with our customers. So I'd love to hear you a little talk a little bit more about how you express the value of collective knowledge and really think about some of the ways that customers can help improve and build this for their companies. Yes, basically, I always tell my customers that don't think about search, just think about how you can provide value to your users. Uh, which means, you know, when you listen to the users, they usually have some pain points, they have some challenges, and, and definitely they have everyday jobs they have to get done. And they they don't tell you they want search. They don't tell you they, they want, you know, a search box, and they, they don't express they want results. They tell you, we need this content, we need that content and those kind of things, or we need this knowledge, uh, or we have to uh, figure out the best way to do this or that. And uh, if you combine those challenges and those needs with other experts at the organizations like Many, many organizations has knowledge managers, other experts, even librarians, or people who work with uh, information architecture, content curators, and those kind of things, which are definitely not IT jobs. Uh, so if you combine their everyday job with the user's needs, it gives you a good mixture of what is really needed and the best and most beautiful challenge is actually translating this to to the language of IT and figuring out how it is all uh, uh, possible to implement everything in 
driven by search because in many cases when they need some information, when they need to find a way, when they need to find some content, it can be a search-driven implementation even if they don't know about it. I think that's a great point. It's really thinking about the search doesn't even feel like search, right? The the traditional search experience there. So if we think about that evolution, um, we think about search being, you know, more of that application basis. It's becoming more intelligent, more personal, more relevant. How would you really help to describe this this evolution that's happening in the technology? And where do you see it going next? I am very excited about it. So those intelligent and personal things when we talk about you know, enterprise search and personalized search, those are really great and involving more and more intelligent uh, technologies. And this is really amazing to see everything has an effect and everything has an impact on search and how we find information and how we want to find and how we want to search for information. So I think it's all going to that direction of having more and more intelligent and more and more personal, I think. However, uh, what I still cannot see and not sure how it will look like in like five years from now is how those intelligent and personalized technologies can be added to and can be combined with uh, custom solutions. In the meaning of, in many cases, enterprise search is great, personalized, generic uh, search is great, but in many cases, what we need is, you know, search-driven specific applications. But uh, I, I am really excited about seeing those new emerging technologies having impact on those custom developed applications as well sooner or later. You know, it seems like a, a common pattern uh, across different workloads and different things that end users do. There's that balance of a curated experience. When somebody goes looking for something, we want them to find this. And then there's the other side, a more dynamic search experience where somebody may be trying to find something and they don't quite know what it is, and maybe even the owners of the knowledge or the content don't know exactly what to promote to that person at that point in time. And that's where the discovery comes in. I, I think it's a really nice mixture, but I think you're right to mm-hmm. say it's interesting to track how those will come together. I, I think one important yep. thing just on the basis of it is both are possible, and both will merge and are merging, and it's great to have your insight and, of course, you out in the field building those experiences based on what customers are asking now and five years from now. Yes, definitely. And as I said at the beginning, customers in many cases cannot express what they really want. So it's very hard to say, what do you want to have in five or even three years? Because you never know. I I, I mean, you can express your needs, but not you are, you maybe cannot express how you want to get there. And I think about that as kind of that that balance, right? So we think about how does an organization really want to use the best of their human intelligence, right, that human curation ability, and then how you think about balancing that with what end users need. So the people who are doing their work every day, and how do we help use some of that machine intelligence uh, to actually help get signal basically from noise there. So Agnes, I'd, I'd love to think about, you know, what's your kind of approach to that balance and, and how customers customers can really think about it? I think uh, it is really important to think about it as a balance between, uh, you know, between different, many different things. And uh, definitely the more customization you do, the more specific applications you can do. Uh, But at the same time, as I said, those intelligent solutions might be still needed and and are still needed in specific cases. So uh, I think both are needed and both have place in each organization. Um, as Mark said, we need both, you know, the discovery part of the story. We also need the search-driven application part of the story. We need enterprise search. We need cross-system search. So those are many different things and 
I have never seen an organization when only one of them were needed. Everyone, I mean, each organization needs needs all of them, but maybe with, you know, uh, different approaches and for different things, but uh, it is always unique. It, there are some custom guidances that we can we can share with everyone like for, for example the more uh, the more controlled and and the more organized content you have the more specific search applications you can develop uh, the, the better your information architecture is the better search you can have and those kind of things but I don't think there is any guidance today for you know, which one you have to use because it's not black and white. It's it's always gray. I would also argue that the if people are going to take the time to curate, add applications, add specific, the who's and what's will find this content and how they'll find it better, that will only make the discovery side even better. The more we know about a piece of content, how people use it, who it's for, the metadata about the uh, content itself, that will only drive the discovery experience to be, you know, improved in lockstep, meaning, you know, the same time you do one, the other will get improved. Uh, so I, I think there is a nice combination of the two and the rigor that yep. whether they decide to be in more control or not, they're going to get that uh, uh, innate benefit no matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. So that's a great sort of segue into thinking about, you know, this this show is really our intrazone, right? It's really thinking about what we do with our intranet and, and SharePoint specifically. So if someone was new to SharePoint, Agnes, kind of where would your, your starting point, your guidance would be for them to, to really get started on this? That's a really good question. And, uh, if, usually you, and if, you say, I... if you say search API, <laughs> I maybe laugh out loud. <laughs> no, no way. No way. To be honest, when I do a you know, I teach a lot and I do workshops uh, around the world. And when I do beginning level of workshops, I always start with, okay, for the first two hours or something like that, let's not talk about SharePoint at all. Uh, why? Because everyone has some experience and everyone has some understanding of different search experiences. For example, everyone uses either Google or Bing. Uh, and they they know that is search. And they in most cases they expect something like that in the enterprise. But when I ask them, okay, what do you do when you want to buy a new bag, for example, you definitely don't go to Bing or don't go to Google but you go to Amazon or any uh, any other shopping sites because you want to buy something. So you need, uh, you know, you need a web shop for that and uh, where you can browse, you can see the pictures of the bags, you can check the size, you can look inside, you can decide if this is what you want or not. You can choose from different colors, different sizes, etc. So you go to a specific application or if you want to travel, Usually you don't go to Google if you want to book a hotel or if you want to book a flight, but you go to Expedia, for example. If you want to check my professional background, you go to LinkedIn and search for my name. So those are specific search, specific applications that we use every single day. We just don't consider them as search. Why? Because we just use them. So this is why, where I usually start my workshops and and make the the attendees think about search applications and different search experiences before we jump into SharePoint, before we jump into you know the search service application or the search schema or the search center or the display templates or anything else, because first of all, we have to understand what we are talking about from the user's perspective. You made me think of kind of a funny thing from a few years ago when we started this search journey that now Naomi is leading for us from a, uh, on the marketing side. A lot of people asked us, why didn't you start with revamping the search center? that center of gravity where everybody goes and searches. And certainly that's where a lot of people customize and think about SharePoint. But what I hear you saying is the value is 
there are a lot of applications that people build on top of search for specific needs, and that might be where you go. I think of a people portal. That's where I would go to look up somebody. If I think about, you know, mm-hmm. checking out a piece of hardware because I need to take it on the road with me, I would go to where the IT department or the, the rental team, you know, allows me to go search what's available to me. And so I think it's really important to know where you start from knowing that it's going to be a little bit more refined with what you're looking for and that somebody's already done some of that lifting from the app side of it. Yes, and in many cases, the users don't even know they do search. <laughs> yep. They just use the go to the people portal, use the IT portal, do select things or navigate to different things, technically speaking, using search, but it's not a search, not a classic search center, so they don't know about it which is, I think this is very exciting when you can, you know, when you see that light in in the organizations and people's eyes when they realize that, wow, how much can be done by search. Definitely. So very exciting stuff. And uh, of course, as, as people, uh, we oftentimes learn more from failure than we do from success. So I'd love to get your take and sort of, you know, we see that future and that possibility of, of what you can do. What are some of the things that you've seen that have gone wrong in terms of search strategy and how people are using search so that others of us can learn from that? Um Yes, first of all, I think the biggest mistake is not having any search strategy when you don't know what you want to do with that. Because it's very easy, you know, when you, for example, read something about display templates or watch a nice webinar which demonstrates a nice display template, you definitely want to have a nice display template immediately. Or you learn something about the search schema and you realize how much you can do by adding new managed properties. You want to do that immediately. But if you don't have any strategy behind it, you just do something here and something there. And without any concept, it probably it's not going to be any better in the long run. So first, just stop and think about what you want to do in midterm and long term and then you can do you can do that step by step of course but still you have to have some even if you don't call it as a strategy just call it a plan or a guideline or something like or a roadmap uh, which you use as a plan in your organization that's that's the most important thing um and 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 also what what I can see, and, and definitely this is a good thing that we ha- we always have new things, for example, in Office 365, and it's, it's really exciting for the users. But you definitely have to have, not, not a roadmap, because you probably cannot have a roadmap for that, but as an organization, you have to have a plan of how to adopt those new things into your organization, even if we are talking about search or uh, Office 365 in general. Um, you have to figure out and you have to find a way to to have the users adopting those new things in your organization. So, Agnes, a recurring question that we have for our guests, uh, you train people all over the world. Maybe one of your new people to train is us, Microsoft. What piece of advice do you have for Microsoft in the search space, specific to SharePoint, Office 365, that we should think about or do? I have to, if you don't mind. The first one would be to invest more into search as a platform where what what we can, you know, customize and and configure more. Uh, and the the other thing is invest more into uh, the management of data term store to I, I know this is a very specific thing, but I have seen this a lot in the last couple of months that uh, organizations want to use heavy taxonomies in SharePoint and the management of data term stories to have a lot of limitations. So I will make sure to at least get the second one, but the whole whole part of your answer to the team in Oslo, I will make sure to send them a link to the podcast. I know you talk with them sometimes, but we'll make sure it comes from us (laughs) so that we'll get your feedback in. It's a wonderful MVP and the amount that Agnes contributes. So always a pleasure to recommend her workshops and sessions at at different conferences. We've got an FAQ section coming up, and hopefully you'll stay around and, and share your FAQ with us. Thank you very much, guys. 
Every episode, we like to focus on an app or best practice of the week uh, or an interesting article or report that you've come across. So first, I'm going to hand it off to you, Naomi. What is your app or best practice of the week? Uh, one of the things I've done recently is actually to put together a little video of all of the, the search experiences. And so I thought it would be really helpful to actually have a tour of this from just a, a pure business user perspective. And so here's me looking for things across all of these different experiences. <laughs> uh, and so <clears throat> that video is up on YouTube, and it's a, an easy way to sort of get introduced to like what's happened in search. And so I think it's helpful just to be able to see all of those little search functionalities. Sometimes when we're very familiar with applications that we use every single single day, like Word and PowerPoint, we're not always as conscious that something new and different has happened as part of those, uh, and especially things like also inside of Windows, right, having that update inside of the Windows operating system. So I walk through all of those things. So best practice is to refresh a little bit of knowledge there and uh, maybe get some tips on, on how you can search better in the future. I'm thinking maybe a weekly video, uh, I like that. Naomi's I like that. search experience, <laughs> or searching with Naomi. <laughs> I, I just like want to know it. what you found. <laughs> kind of incredible. <laughs> so is my app or best practice of the week? It's actually an interesting article that I came across, and uh, it wasn't too much of a surprise why I came across it, because now we've got Bob German, who works at Microsoft. He's a prolific writer. Oftentimes what he writes about is more for the developer, so I have to admit it goes over my head. He recently published a new blog post on his blog that's called The Vantage Point. And this blog that caught my eye is titled, What is Modern SharePoint and Why Should I Care? Even though he's now working at Microsoft, it's still a really nice real-world perspective uh, to his work all around uh, and how he perceives it, both as a developer, but I think also just as a user. And the article breaks down modern versus classic uh, literally and visually. So it's a really nice read. He also has a ton of graphics that show here SharePoint in classic mode, here's SharePoint in modern mode. And just to kind of translate that before you go off and read it, we'll put a link in the show notes, is you'll see what does a team site look like from 2010 or 2013? What does it look like now? And then, of course, what are the benefits? So there's a definite different look and feel. Uh, of course, everything is going mobile. Uh, you know, a modern team site is much more mobile these days. But it also has inherent... Uh, connections to other apps across the suite. And so he breaks that down. What does a publishing site look like in the past? What does it look like in comparison to a communication site? And across all the vectors you can think of, he does a really nice job of what does modern mean to you and why should you care is really he articulates what are the benefits. So if you know who Bob German is or not, just know he's a great uh, expert out in the world. Now working at Microsoft, that's our benefit. But to your benefit, check out his article and really get a sense of what does it mean to think about classic versus modern. But I also think there's underpinnings of what does it mean to move from classic to modern and some of the gotchas or some of the benefits that you're going to get once you get there. Our partner highlight segment is where we feature someone who represents both the community and the SharePoint ecosystem. Today, we're really excited to talk with Jeff Reed at BEN Sunt. It's really been a pleasure to work with Jeff over many years in, in different roles. He's been at BA Insight for over seven years and was previously the CTO there. And he now serves as the chairman of that organization's advisory board. So really delighted to have you, Jeff, and always a pleasure. Great to be here, Naomi, and great to talk to you too, Mark. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Uh, certainly as being an advocate over the years of a ton of things, seeing you at a lot of events, knowing you in person, both inside and outside of Microsoft, I'm really happy to have you here uh, and really happy to have you here to talk about BA Insights and give it a little bit of insights on BA Insights. As you know, I'm super excited about the SharePoint ecosystem overall and the power of search in SharePoint and in the Office 365 suite all up. So this will be a fun conversation. So per your website, BA Insight website, um, you, you know, you guys focus on making search intelligent by connecting machine learning, cognitive computing, and enterprise systems to help you, the user, power a new generation of intranets and cognitive search solutions. So we want to dive into that a little deeper to learn about both you and BA Insight. So First question, what do you and BA Insight offer to customers? How would you, how would you summarize it in your own words? Uh, well, to keep it really simple, we aim to make search successful for our customers and to make it easy to craft search-driven applications. And the point of view that we bring is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, that each 
organization has some specific needs and therefore needs to tailor things to fit their application or their climate, if you will. Uh, so over the years, we've built out a portfolio of products that includes connectors to now almost 70 different systems. It includes a whole set of natural language processing and metadata generation that we call it auto classifier. It includes uh, a, a user interface as well as specific applications such as for expertise location. Uh, all the while making sure that we're building on top of what Microsoft provides and not duplicating things that are built into the into the underlying platform. Yeah, it certainly is a re repeating pattern for partners that I think are successful today, but also have been successful over the course of time. You know, we, we make changes, uh, certainly you make changes, and certainly our customers' expectations change. And I think the thing that I really liked about what you said is, you know, each individual customer, of course, is going to require a different approach. What do they need? What do they need now? Where do they want to go? Uh, and so I think it's, you know, interesting that flexibility, I think there's some uh, strategy that you have and some methods, certainly, that you approach to that, what could be a little bit mind-boggling, you know, how, why not to just have a thing out of the box that works for everybody? So I think that's kind of where we wanted to go with the next question, which is when you take that approach, you know, individualizing per each customer, how do you think about designing and implementing for modern intranets with these search solutions? You know, that could be from the evolution of what we're doing, but I think it's more interesting as you see your customers evolve. What does that mean to your approach? That's a good question, and I'd say there's two main modes that I see with our customers. The first is what I'd call a enlightened strategy-based customer that starts with saying, I have information everywhere in my organization. I'm sort of, there's different modes of that, but getting at the information people need to do their jobs or get business insight is really important. And realize that there's no sort of one size fits all magic. In those scenarios, we're often doing, I'll say, a business mapping of people of what are the most important areas down to the role and application, and what's the easiest to accomplish. So the most generic cases, like finding information that's published on the intranet for HR, are usually a matter of sort of tuning or tweaking the out-of-the-box experience. Whereas the most focused cases, and this might be, for example, people in the legal space doing patent discovery, patent search, and ring fencing around strategy actually require development. And in between, there's a whole spectrum of things that can be done through Lego building blocks, building on top of the Microsoft stack. So, you know, when you've got this spectrum of customer, uh, I think the, uh, the other part of the matrix that's interesting is the spectrum of users within that customer. You know, you set it up on behalf of, you know, whoever you meet with and whatever their need is, but then it comes to the end user and how they're going to take advantage of that once it's in place. So once your solution is in place, what, what does that mean for the end user? What, what improves for them? What gets better? Generically speaking, users are able to find what they need and get their job done more easily. And organizations are able to have a single version of the truth that's shared across the organization so they're less confused and more efficient. More specifically, end users of our technology often have multiple applications that might be a tab in a center so that, for example, let's say they're a law firm and they're looking to provide a brief for a particular customer on a particular topic, they'll have a specific place to go where they assemble all of the relevant things in a course of searching and discovering things and then click a button that will generate a brief. I've learned that legal briefs are often hundreds of pages, so I don't know why they call them brief, <laughs> but that's the flavor of it. Or if they're a pharmaceutical, there'll be a set of users that is about drug discovery and they get very, very deep. 
So one of the things I still love about this space is that there's a whole level of domain expertise from people that don't really know the domain to people that are super expert and are, are getting into very, very detailed discovery and exploration. And there's a domain of, of literacy in how you browse, search, find, explore, and you usually need to create a solution that works for that whole spectrum. We find, though, that having modes that work for domain experts is very, very effective, either by, in most cases today, literally making another, you know, one place to go, but it's different for you and me. And where we're working towards is to have the system figure out that, oh, Mark, you're now looking for something in this, what's called the explore mode as opposed to a lookup mode. And let's change the experience to make it work for what you need right now. Yeah, I, I like those aspects of I sign in and it knows who I am, not in a creepy big brother way, but in a helpful guiding way. You know, let me find the content that you're looking for much faster. I also really liked what you said around, and I think you were touching on the reusability of content. You know, if it's a big brief or like you might say a big monster and the thing that you're looking for is 30 pages in or 500 pages in, whatever the case might be, Finding what you need, finding the actual part that you need, and being able to repurpose it. That scenario of search, finding what you need, but leading you into getting your job done much quicker, I think that that touches on uh, something that would obviously affect and and help everybody. Um, So, Jeff, we wanted to move into, you know, you are an expert in search, and you might be an expert as a gardener as well, so we don't want to limit you to just search. (laughs) But, you know, when, when people are listening to this, we also like to get from you, now that we've got this moment with you, um, what is your user tip when you think about people using search or, or anything uniquely valuable about SharePoint or Office 365? What's that one tip that you would uh, you share with, with our users and, and people that you talk to? Uh, I thought you were going to ask me for a gardening tip. <laughs> no, which is, well, know, that's scary. That's, that's part two. If you've got a green thumb, I'm open to it. <laughs> All right. That's good. I, I specialize in killing things in overgrown areas. <laughs> but you know, back to the... Search advice, and there's a a whole lot of areas for this, I'll say most often the advice I want to give people is that you can incorporate content from many, many different places. So the number one reason people can't find things is they haven't indexed it. And that's why BA Insight evolved a big portfolio of connectors because people don't have all of their information in one system. Even in a broad suite like Office 365, there's always systems that are important, that are specialized, that are elsewhere. So the tip is to just be aware that you can bring in content. Now, I I will add that the number two reason people often don't find things is that they've brought in too much that's effectively clogging up things, and they need to sort of be a little bit more discretionary about what they incorporate. If your OneDrive has everything that you've ever created and everything your sister ever created since the beginning of time, it's going to be harder to find things on it, even with a super smart system. Gotcha. So basically, uh, increase where you look and minimize the things that you have to look for or across. Yeah. Uh, And focus helps. Having a, a, that's one of the things that it's great to see Microsoft building in in personalization is that who you are, it gives a lot of context to the machine about what to serve up to you. And what you're doing is even even more important. And that varies, obviously, throughout the day. Thanks, Jeff. We really, really appreciate your insights. It's always such a pleasure to talk with you and to have BAA Insight as being part of our rich ecosystem of partners that we have for SharePoint. So always a pleasure. Uh, I do want to ask, you know, we're going to see you obviously at SharePoint Conference at North America on May 21st, but we do want to ask how else can people learn more about you and BA Insights? Oh, sure. Besides coming and visiting us at the SharePoint North America Conference, you can go to our website, bainsight.com. There's lots of resources there, as well as information about BA Insight products and solutions. There's a Contact Us page right there, as well as you can reach us on Twitter at BA Insight. I'm Jeff Freed, 
simply uh, on, on, on Twitter and look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. Jeff, we also have a frequently asked question of the week section at the end. Uh, we hope you'll stay with us and share your FAQ of the week. I absolutely would be happy to. It's not gardening. <laughs> not gardening. <laughs> Every day we get questions from SharePoint users, customers, and partners. Uh, and this is our opportunity to relay and provide answers to some of the most frequently asked questions. Um, I'll kick it off. The most common question I've gotten recently is based on the recent HubSites launch. So we launched SharePoint HubSites on March 21st of this year. And I often get asked, how does the news roll-up work? So basically what it is is news from associated sites, team sites, and communication sites when they're brought in and, and associated to a hub site, their news will start to roll up to the hub site homepage. And there's the news web part, which is like any other news web part, but on the homepage of the hub, you can program it to show news from the host associated sites. The one thing that's important to know is as the news flows up, it still is bound to the permissions that you have on that news. So there will be news flowing from multiple sites, but on the hub, if I'm there, as I sign into the hub, it knows who I am, and I will only see the news that's coming from things that I have permissions to see. If I don't have permissions, I just won't even see it. The other thing is how to publish news. You know, you, you then start to think about, well, who is my target audience? If it's just my team, I'll publish news at the team site level. If it's for a little bit broader, maybe a communication site on a certain topic, I would publish there. But if it really is meant to be a little bit more for the whole region or for the whole corpus of people that have been brought together within this hub site, I actually might publish the news at the hub site home level, which then, of course, everybody has visibility to from the permissions of who has access to get to the hub. So there's a lot of ways you can control it. It's based on where do you publish it and just the awareness of when you publish it. It's still bound to the same permissions that you have when you have news as you publish it anywhere. If you don't have permissions to see it, you won't. But if you do, you'll start to see a collection of news across all associated sites. And you might even see it recommended to you on SharePoint Home by the Microsoft Graph. That's right. The power of the news service certainly has benefited from the hub, but it's also now just an extension of the whole news service. And how it works certainly with the Microsoft Graph means you'll see some news maybe in from sites that you don't even participate in, but is related to people that you are working with, which is great. I'm Curious, you might get a question or two every week. Oh, just a few, <laughs> just a few. I think everybody specializes in keeping my mailbox beautifully busy, um, but it, it's all good. It's all good. But one of the big questions I have been getting since Ignite last year is when we announced our private preview of Bing for Business. Uh, and so we get a lot of questions on like, what is this Bing for Business? Is this replacing SharePoint search? What is this? Okay. So I do want to clarify there. Um, so Bing for Business is an amazing new experience. We're so excited to have it as part part of the other search experiences that we have in Microsoft 365. And it really is fulfilling that area of maybe if you don't know where to start your search, then Bing for Business is a great place to start. And so it's bringing you together the best of both your work results as well as web results. And so when we look at Bing for Business, it means that when I log on to Bing.com as an end user, uh, and so long as I have connected in my Office 365 account and I've got everything set up there from a, an admin perspective, then I can actually get results that are coming from the Microsoft Graph as part of my regular results page when I do a search on Bing. And that makes it exciting because I can do some very quick lookups on there. I use this service all the time to find like a campus map. So if I'm trying to find where Mark is and the recording studios, where is that building? Uh, doing a really quick search is much easier just to open your web browser sometimes and, and do that. And so I see those, those results segregated, segregated for my work results in a special little area. It's got a nice little company logo on it so that I know it's official results and it's coming from my, my corporate intranet results. But I can also see the best of my work-related uh, work web queries as well. So I'm seeing regular public intranet sites. So if I do a search for Mark Cashman, as I often do, often. Uh, often, all the time. And so as I search for Mark, I will see both his people card, that's a familiar experience for me from the rest of Office 365. So I'll see your information that comes from our central Office 365 profile service. So I'll see that because I'm logged in and I'm a work result user, but I'll also see everything that Mark has been doing on the interwebs. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> so sometimes it's faster just to go to the web, right? so, so let's be honest. But it's a great way to sort of really have another experience in there. Oftentimes, people start their searches, you know, by accident in some ways or not knowing anything different of like, should I search the intranet? 
internet? Should I search the internet? Right? And this is a great way to have both of those results sets together. So we're super excited to have them again as another experience powered by the Microsoft Graph uh, inside of Microsoft 365. Yeah, and I think that just gets to the importance of the value of the consistency of the search experience where you're at. Mm -hmm. And if you were primarily maybe going to look at something on the internet, there's still value of being able to discover things from the intranet. Mm -hmm. And I think having that combined view, my, my where I was was Bing. And what I find there is not maybe just from my what I thought about Bing being just internet-based, which exactly. is I think is really cool. Back to what you said, it really, I think, hits home. Um, the other thing that got me mentioned, thinking about it because you keep searching for me, which I find I fascinating. Do. I'm just I down do. the hall, you know. <laughs> All right, Jeff, thanks for hanging in with us. What is your FAQ of the week? We get a lot of questions across a big surface area for search, but the one that comes up maybe five, six times a week is about how you tailor your search experience. And this is in both user perspective, how do I change things to tweak it so I get what I want? But usually it's an administrator. And query rules are the simple answer. So if you're not familiar with the use of query rules, they're a great facility that's built in to Office 365 and SharePoint Search. There's good information right on TechNet about them, and it makes it very easy for you to take the kind of specific things, people who are asking about your prime product or project, to take them right to where you want them to find stuff. Thank you very much, Jeff. So let's turn and get our FAQ from Agnes. Agnes, we're uh, at the time where we want to hear what is your frequently asked question, and of course, more importantly, what's your answer? I think the most important one would be related to content migration and its relationship to search, how to consider it. And usually I recommend to do search first migration. So consider search first and then do the migration and clean up the content during the content migration. That's an important one. Gotcha. Yeah, it's important to know what you have, but I think also important to know what you want to move based on what you want people to find, right? Yes, because when you migrate the content, you know, it's always a good opportunity to improve a lot of things as well. Gotcha. Excellent. Thank you, Agnes, for being on the show. And for everyone, Agnes is an expert in search, information, architecture, and Microsoft technologies. Agnes has been a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional, or MVP, since 2008, and we're so pleased to have her on the show today. To learn more about Agnes, follow her on Twitter at Search Explained. As you think about going a little bit deeper with SharePoint, we always encourage you to join one of the events. There's always either a SharePoint Saturday going on close to you. There's a number of different conferences like SP Fest and SharePoint TechCon. Um, and, of course, we've got a really big one coming up. So plug in. We want you to get you know all the training that you need. And if you want to join us in Las Vegas in May, May 21st through the 23rd, join us for the SharePoint Conference North America. You can see what's going on pre-conference on Twitter. Twitter if you use the hashtag SPC18 and follow the Twitter handle SPCConf. That's S-P-C-O-N-F. If you register today, you'll see there's a lot of great offerings in terms of the different sessions, workshops. There's a lot of people coming from Microsoft that will be there to present and, of course, be there to engage and chat as from a community perspective. We've got a ton of MVPs that are going to come and share their best practices, share what they've learned, what their companies offer. And, of course, there's going to be one big keynote with Jeff Teeper, our corporate vice president on the engineering side, and some of our marketing leaders, uh, Seth Patton, Dan Holm, and a lot of other people that will be there to show you a lot of the new announcements and to put in context a lot of what we've released within the last three to six months. So it's a big event for us. It's a real event in terms of what you're going to get there. News, announcements, best practices, training, workshops. Super easy to find if you go to sharepointna.com. Register today. Hope to see you in Vegas. It's going to be a great show. Lots of news and announcements, lots of um, practical learnings, and of course, great community. And if you like nighttime activities, there's going to be a giant SharePoint. So don't miss it. If you want to learn a little bit more about me, Mark Cashman, you can follow me on Twitter. That's at M Cashman with a K, M K A S H M A N. And I often write a lot of our news and announcements blogs on the SharePoint community blog. To find Naomi, you can follow her on Twitter. She's N Moneypenny, N 
M O N E Y P E N N Y. She also has her own website, NaomiMoneyPenny.com, and you can find her on LinkedIn as well, MoneyPenny. Thank you to our guests, Agnes Molnar and Jeff Freed. It was a pleasure talking to both of them and hearing their insights and what they and their companies are doing. Be sure to check out their sites to learn more about them, their expertise, and their offerings. You can also find their information in our show notes on the podcast page. Visit bainsight.com to learn more about Jeff Freed and follow him on Twitter at bainsight. And to learn more about Agnes Molnar, follow her on Twitter at searchexplained. S-E-A-R-C-H-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-E-D. Thanks so much for listening. We're glad you joined us today. We're your hosts, Mark Cashman and Naomi Moneypenny. And this has been The IntraZone, a show about the SharePoint Intelligent Intranet. And follow us on Facebook at MS SharePoint and on Twitter at SharePoint. Also, we encourage you to send in your comments and questions for our SharePoint team and guests on the show. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's official. We are very much in the final sprint to election day. And face it, between debates, polling releases, even court appearances, it can feel exhausting, even impossible to keep up with. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm the host of Start Here, the daily podcast from ABC News. And every morning, my team and I get you caught up on the day's news in a quick, straightforward way that's easy to understand with just enough context so you can listen, get it, and go on with your day. So kickstart your morning. Start smart with Start Here and ABC News because staying informed shouldn't feel overwhelming.